Welcome back, everyone, to part four of our reaction series to Simon Bolivar uh, on Extra History. Thank you so much uh, to this entire community for pushing this channel over 60,000 subscribers yesterday. I never in a million years thought when I started doing reaction videos that we would grow this soon, this fast, uh, this much, this fast. It's uh, just been exciting to watch and every one of you who have subscribed to this channel are a part of that growth and a part of this community and I'm grateful for it and I look forward to the continued growth and the continued development of this community. So before we get into part four of Simon uh, Bolivar, if you did not see the first three episodes of my reactions, there's a link in the description below as well as a link to the original part four. Uh, which you can see uh, over on Extra Credits. Uh, just a little fun tidbit for today. Uh, let's talk about one of the namesakes of so Simon Bolivar, and he's actually a Confederate general uh, named Simon Bolivar Buckner, who was born in 1823, which was right in the middle of Simon Bolivar's kind of uh, independence movement and when he was making a name for himself. Interesting that a family in Munfordville, Kentucky, would choose to name their third child. Uh, after the South American Revolutionary, but that's what they did. And Simon Bolivar Buckner plays a, a significant role in the American Civil War. He's a good friend before the war uh, to Ulysses S. Grant, actually bails him out financially at one point. Uh, and then after the war, Simon Bolivar Buckner, a couple decades after the war, has a son, Simon Bolivar Buckner Jr., who will go on to become the highest ranking American uh, officer to be killed in World War II. Simon Bolivar Buckner Jr. was, I think, a lieutenant general who was killed uh, in the battle for Okinawa late in the war in the Pacific. So uh, just a little bit of an interesting tidbit about his namesake, but let's go ahead and dive into part four. And Simon Bolivar retreated to New Granada to reignite the revolution. But New Granada was not the place Bolivar had left it. The state had fatally fractured. Much of the country was controlled by a man who had violently opposed Bolivar's expedition to Venezuela. The two came into conflict. Bolivar's ragged army was not allowed to rest or resupply. The situation got desperate, escalated, and then word came. The unthinkable had happened. The British had kicked Napoleon out of Spain. The reinstated Spanish king set to putting his empire in order, and sent thousands of Spanish veterans fresh from the Napoleonic Wars to crush the Granadan Revolution. Split and disunited as they were, weakened by previous losses, the Republican forces stood no chance. Disarmed and penniless, Bolivar made his escape to Jamaica, where he would spend wow. the next two years. But there, his previous ideas would return to him with renewed force. He would look back on the disasters and the bloodshed and decide two things. First, that no one nation would find its independence alone. Independence for Venezuela would not only require independence for all Spanish America, but the formation of one great state that... So that's interesting, and of course the, the one great state doesn't happen, but if you look at the independence movements in South America, I was looking over this a little bit last night, um, not trying to get ahead of myself, but just kind of curious a little more of the background. Uh, in this period, uh, between about 1819 or so and like 1830, all of South America becomes independent with the the little exception of like French Guiana and I think Suriname uh, up along the, the northeastern coast uh, north of Brazil. Uh, basically, the entire continent, except for this little tiny bit right here, becomes independent in about a decade. So it's interesting. I'll, I'll be curious to see how that all unfolded and how it became just such a domino effect. Could rival Spain. And second, that to do so, he must also get rid of internal divides. The fact that the Creoles, the Africans, the mixed-race population, and the Native Americans were all at one another's throat made any revolution impossible. It made any attempt to form a republic descend into anarchy and civil war. But his reverie was disturbed by an attempt on his life. Mm. His manservant, in the dead of night, crept into his room and stabbed over and over and over again the man sleeping in his hammock. Wasn't him. Only the vicissitudes of fortune had placed another man there that night. Wow. Bolivar's former paymaster. He had journeyed to see Bolivar, and upon not finding him home, lay down to rest, only uh. to be mortally mistaken for his boss. Jeez. But though he had dodged death, this was enough for Bolivar. He knew he had to leave Jamaica. This time he made his way to Haiti, where he at last found the support he couldn't raise anywhere else. 
But it came with a price. Haiti had been a slave colony. It had become free through its own revolution, won by slaves who rose up and declared the land their own. Now their president offered to arm Bolivar if he would set the slaves of Spanish America mm. free. Bolivar neither denied the help nor dismissed the idea. And so he started again to marshal a force for an invasion of the mainland, drawing to him all sorts of wild characters, adventurers and die-hard patriots, the wildest of all perhaps being Gregor McGregor, a Scotsman who brought to the fray those mightiest Scottish weapons of war, the kilt and the bagpipe. Wait, wait a second, we've got a Scottish dude named Gregor McGregor fighting alongside... Uh, South Americans for independence from Spain. This is fantastic, and I'm just trying to picture this in my head. This guy, we've got his hairy legs going on here, wearing his kilt with his bagpipes. Uh, I know it's all kind of very stereotypical of Scottish people, but uh, wow, this is really cool. And the war was on. Or, well, no, it wasn't, because Bolivar made a slight detour with his entire fleet to pick up one of his mistresses. But after that, yes, the war was on. Or rather, it was all over the place. If you can make a mess of disasters, Bolivar certainly did it here. His forces squandered and in disarray, soon he found himself fleeing back to Haiti, leaving what little of his country that wasn't in royalist hands in the hands of warlords. All right, this guy, it's just been one disaster after another. I am fascinated to know how on earth he's going to pull all this together because it just seems like it's just one example of ineptitude and failure after another. So how is this all going to come together for him? But he had lived up to his promise. He had proclaimed freedom for all slaves. And so Pétion, the president of the Haitian Republic, welcomed him back and offered to arm him once again. Bolivar's force was small, but this time he learned. This time he knew that rather than simply focusing on the big cities, he had to win the countryside. And okay. so he drew his remaining revolutionary friends to his side, and with his proclamation of liberation, he drew in former slaves who had once been his enemies. But perhaps most surprising, and most important, the leader of the Legion of Hell had died, mm. and the new leader of these Plains horsemen saw more benefit in aligning his forces with the new, more egalitarian revolutionaries than with the Spanish. Okay. And while his horsemen were winning victories, Bolivar saw an opportunity. In the rainy season, long after campaigning would normally come to a halt, in a move reminiscent of nothing so much as Hannibal's crossing the Alps, Bolivar decides to take those men who would follow him and cross the Andes into New Granada. So do, like if you're talking Hannibal crossing the Alps, do something nobody thinks is possible and everyone thinks would be ridiculous and stupid to attempt uh, to surprise your enemy. Okay, I get that. The trek is brutal. Vicious wind whips at them, food is scarce, men and horses freeze to death. But in July, the middle of South American winter, his forces appear from out of the mountains, gaunt and sallow but alive, and ready to fight. With every step through the countryside, Bolivar raised more men, for New Granada had been independent for six years and hadn't had the revolution beaten out of it the same way Venezuela had. And so, with his ranks growing, he moved toward the lightly defended capital of Bogota. The enemy was taken by complete surprise. Spanish forces were scattered. There was almost no garrison at the capital, and no force blocking the path from Bolivar's unexpected entry point into the country of Bogota. Mm. So the Spanish forces raced toward the capital in an effort to get there before Bolivar's army. But Bolivar moved to intercept them, even though his force was much smaller, and the men he had that weren't exhausted from the journey over the mountains were woefully undertrained. But his speed and tenacity won again, and in battle after battle, he overtook and surprised Spanish okay. forces, crushing the Spanish will to fight. At last, he captured Bogota. And you have to remember that any time people are fighting for their freedom in their home territory against basically what is a foreign army that's trying to hold on to an empire, there's always going to be a discrepancy between the will to fight between these two groups of people. Uh, you see the same thing with any revolution, really, where people are fighting for their freedom. You even see it with the American Civil War, which to the Southerners was a revolution, uh, even though, of course, the North didn't see it that way. Um, you had people defending their own territory, fighting for what they viewed as their freedom against other people, and there's a will to fight that goes along with that. 
the Spanish Viceroy had fled, and he'd been in such a hurry to escape Bolivar's onrushing army that he'd left the treasury behind uh -huh. and the armory stocked. Bolivar, at last, had the resources he needed to wage the campaign that he had always envisioned. Some time ago, he had given in to the democratic clamor of the people, and had at last established a congress. Now he summoned them to the recaptured capital. He wanted to set in motion the first part of his bold plan. He called on them to establish the nation of Gran Colombia. And so, on the 17th of December, 1821, Gran Colombia was formed. Gran Colombia would be a state large enough and powerful enough to maintain its independence. Mm. It would combine New Granada, Venezuela, and Quito, which we now roughly know Ecuador. as Ecuador, into one massive nation. And New Granada would be today Colombia. Capable of securing its liberty forever. There was only one minor problem with this plan. At the time, the Spanish still controlled Venezuela, Quito, and about half of New Granada. But Bolivar was never one to sweat the details, and so set about marshalling troops to make his invented nation a reality. Luckily for him, almost simultaneously, a revolt flared back up in Spain, weakening the king's ability to reinforce his American colonies and pulling Spanish attention away from colonial affairs. With this news, one of Bolivar's great enemies, the Captain General of Venezuela, the man who had been called in to so violently and mm. brutally put down the colonial revolt and reestablish Spanish rule, asked to be recalled and left the Americas forever. Uh -huh. One by one, the rats were leaving the ship. And so, at last, Bolivar once again swept back into his home country. But for the first time in his life, he was leading a larger, better armed force than that he faced. And this time, his men carried with them a sense of victory. A sense that was realized at the Battle of Carabobo on the 24th of June, 1821. Bolivar had caught the royalists on the road from Valencia. It was to be the decisive fight. The Spanish drew up and pushed the Republican forces hard. The line wavered, but the British Legion held firm, and the rest of the Republicans regained their confidence. Then Bolivar's cavalry swung in. The band of horsemen the Royalists had with them simply vanished from the battlefield. The loyalties of the local horsemen had long since changed, mm. and Bolivar's lancers tore through the Spanish line. Soon, it was over. Spanish power had been broken. So let's read a little bit more about that battle, because I'm curious to know what the numbers were. How big were the armies involved? How many casualties were there? How long did the battle go on for? Let's check that out. Okay, so we're on the uh, military wiki uh, page here, and it looks like it was just a one-day battle. Uh, there were actually, uh, in addition to uh, Bolivar's patriots, he also had British legions fighting on his side, which I guess makes sense. Uh, in a sense, uh, the British want to... Uh, actually, I don't know. You would think the British would be on the side of the Spanish. I don't know. Uh, so it looks like between 6,500 and 8,000 total on the side of Simon Bolivar, 4,000 infantry, about 1,000 British, 2,500 ca uh, cavalry against four to 5,000 on the side of Miguel de la Torre, uh, and uh, 2,900 captured, wounded, or dead, 200 dead on Bolivar's side. So pretty decisive, it seems. It's uh, commemorated as the Battle of Carabobo Day, Army Day in Venezuela. Uh, so that's a day that is still remembered to this day. It's the largest military parade in the country after the celebration of the birth of General Simon Bolivar and the annual, annual Independence Day parades. Uh, and Bolivar's dog died during the Battle of Carabobo. Doesn't look like there's any more information about it than that, but I'm curious to know why that happened. Maybe somebody can use the comment section below and let us know what happened to Simon Bolivar's dog that it died during the battle. The last royalists wouldn't be pushed out for two more years, but with the victory at Carabobo, Venezuela finally, truly, became free. But Gran Colombia wasn't done yet. Quito had been undergoing a slow and grinding revolutionary campaign for about a year, and it looked to be at somewhat of a stalemate. The men, material, and supplies of Gran Colombia were about to change all that. Yes, Bolivar was sending someone else weapons and troops. Revolution indeed. By the middle of 1822, in a dramatic battle 3,500 feet above sea level, mm. the question of Quito was decided. Here, too, the Spanish were repulsed, and here, too, the local populace overwhelmingly proclaimed their desire to join Gran Colombia. But Bolivar's work was not done. The Royalists still had a stronghold on the continent. They still held the territory of Peru. 
Bolivar quickly got himself declared dictator of Peru, huh. which is a little awkward because he's already president of Gran Colombia, but hey, why let your current job as a democratic head of state get in the way of a good dictatorship? As such, he galvanized the efforts to throw off foreign monarchy in the country. Then he fell dreadfully ill. The army was plagued with revolts and counter-revolts. Large sections of the fighting force changed sides and then changed sides again. But as the disturbances in Spain grew, and the king rolled back all the policies made by its short-lived constitutional government and declared his power absolute, mm. it only further fractured the royalist cause in Peru. This wasn't lost on Bolivar, who, while recovering, started another campaign against the royalists, knowing full well that, with access to the resources of his newly formed Gran Colombia, all he had to do was wear the remaining forces down. It all came to a head when he had a large royalist force contained in the mountains. The royalist position was supremely defensible, but Bolivar knew that they didn't have the supplies to survive in the mountains long. So all he had to do was wait. Wait him out. And wait he did, until the royalists finally attacked out of desperation. But the very things that made their position so good for defense hampered their every move. Hmm. Their units were raked with gunfire as they tried to clamber down the mountainside. Their unit cohesion was disrupted. Order was hard to maintain. As the sun passed its zenith, the royalist viceroy was captured. It was clear their lines were starting to disintegrate. Terms were offered, terms were accepted. Peru, too, was wow. now free. Join us next time as Bolivar offers to bring Peru into Gran Colombia and... So I'm going to be really curious to find out what goes wrong. Uh, and I don't know, is it something as simple as Simon Bolivar dies and because he was the man that held it all together, he couldn't keep it going? That happens a lot in history where a very powerful conqueror or leader... Uh, creates this large empire, but then he dies and it gets fractured in the aftermath of his death because you don't have another leader to fill that vacuum. I don't know if that's what happened or if it's just sectarian violence and differing uh, cultures and opinions and ideas. Uh, I'll be very curious to see why this Gran Colombia plus Peru doesn't last as, a, as an empire. So let me know your thoughts about all that. Use a comment section below, hit that like button. We will be back tomorrow with part five. Thanks for watching.